Western. I'm sure we all know the word yoga, and there are numerous uh, variations. There is, of course, hatha yoga, uh, kriya yoga, siddhi yoga, hot yoga. The other day I saw advertised glasshouse yoga. Um, I'm not sure what that is, but uh, the word itself comes from the Indian sage Patanjali, and it's unclear precisely when he lived, but probably two or three centuries before Christ. And he wrote or composed the, what are called the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali, and uh, this is uh, quite an extensive treatise. Uh, the, the vogue at that time was to compose in short statements called sutras, and uh, these are pithy statements, and they have been interpreted many, many times uh, since uh, Patanjali lived. But it's good to start at the beginning, and what he says right at the start is that yoga is the restraint, the quiescence, the coming to stillness of the movements of the mind. And the word mind here should be understood broadly. The movements of what we would perhaps call the mind and the heart. So yoga is when all these movements come to rest. And in the next sutra, Patanjali says that when this happens, then one abides in one's true nature. And that true nature is full of bliss, full of sweetness, full of light. So that's how the work starts. And if anyone talks to you about uh, yoga, you'll be able to remind them, Chitta Riti Nirodha. Uh, yoga is the uh, coming to rest of the movements of the mind. And so the question arises, how is that possible? How is that practical? And as far as we are concerned in the school, we count ourselves as being most blessed by having the mantra meditation, which uh, we've had now for over 50 years, and the object of this is indeed to bring the mind and heart to complete stillness so that we may indeed abide in our own real, true nature. So, as I say, this is how the Yoga Sutra of uh, Patanjali begins. But it's no small matter to bring the mind and heart completely to rest. And Patanjali, like the School of Philosophy, is most practical. And a little later on, he sets out four attitudes of mind, or predispositions. Uh, the Sanskrit word is bhavana, uh, which means an emotional attitude. And he says that uh, these four are conducive to the tranquility of mind, which uh, constitutes yoga. So I thought we could uh, just uh, go through these, because they are indeed practical. Uh, the first in English is friendliness. And the idea here is that uh, your colleagues, your uh, compatriots, your uh, fellow group members, the natural uh, disposition of the mind and heart is one of friendliness. So if you go to work in your office or wherever and there's a friendly atmosphere, then uh, you count yourself blessed. If there's an atmosphere of uh, enmity, of backbiting, of uh, rivalry, of politics and so on, uh, life's difficult. It takes its toll. And if we engage in such uh, 
attitudes of mind, all of that makes meditation extremely difficult. Because if the mind gets filled with something such, let's take rivalry as an example, if the mind gets uh, caught up with rivalry, then when you sit down to meditate, when you want to fall completely still, then suddenly into the mind there's this rivalry and the various rivals that uh, you may have. So the friendliness um, in Sanskrit, a maitri, is conducive to tranquility of mind. In uh, religious terms, uh, a convent would uh, be made up of sisters, and so it would be called a sisterhood. A monastery would be made up of monks who would constitute a brotherhood. And the idea with both is uh, a very close friendship. In the school in uh, London, uh, technically speaking, it's made up of what we call a fellowship, which is the same idea. And a fellowship connotes a fellow feeling, a sense of friendliness, a sense of unity. And so this is the first uh, attitude of mind that uh, Patanjali advises us to adopt and to cultivate. The second attitude of mind is, um, in Sanskrit, a karuna, compassion. He says that uh, where somebody is, let us say, younger than you, uh, weaker than you, uh, in some more difficult uh, position than you, the natural desire is to help. Whether that's possible or practical or not, will depend on the circumstances. But this would be the, uh, the natural response. In Europe, we have a <coughs> similar problem, I think, to here, uh, with a, a, a seemingly unending supply of possible refugees coming from all sorts of different uh, countries wanting to come into Europe. And uh, the, the, the circumstances in which some of these people find themselves are indeed uh, most uh, desperate. And then they find themselves at the mercy of unscrupulous uh, people smugglers. Uh, and it's not the desire to help which is motivating this activity. And it's a, it's a ruthless, unscrupulous uh, trade in human history. And uh, this is inconsistent with the <laughs> tranquility of mind which constitutes yoga. Because if, uh, if a person is ruthless in this sort of way, uh, cruel, harsh, then that also will haunt the mind. Shakespeare in uh, Macbeth talks about the scorpions in the mind. <laughs> and uh, there can be scorpions in the mind in this sort of way. So, we have friendliness, compassion, and the third is uh, joy. And in particular, joy uh, when you meet somebody who is wiser than you, uh, stronger than you, better than you, more talented than you, uh, if you can imagine such a thing. Uh, <laughs> and uh, the best response is to be delighted at his or her wisdom, talent, strength, whatever. Not to be jealous of it. So in the school, for example, if somebody shows some uh, brilliance, some talent, some aptitude, 
uh, it's to be encouraged because that's why people come to the school, so that uh, we may grow. And um, if the uh, idea was to squash that, to crush that, to push it to one side, it wouldn't be a very good place to be. So again, this gives a great freedom of mind and openness of heart the joy in somebody else's ability. One only has to think of the opposite, uh, really the jealousy uh, or fear uh, of somebody else's ability, and that again would haunt the mind. And this may not be uncommon in, uh, um, in the business world, the commercial world, somebody might in a company, see somebody coming up through the ranks and he or she seems very talented and energetic and the person may think, goodness me, it's only going to be five minutes before that person takes my job. Um, and so all sorts of things happen which uh, are inconsistent with uh, yoga. The last one is equanimity. And in particular, uh, if we find somebody opposed to us, uh, hostile to us, uh, against us in some way, to meet such opposition with equanimity, with resilience. Uh, not to meet it with hatred, not to meet it with uh, fear, but with equ equanimity and resilience. So these are the four dispositions of mind and heart that uh, Patanjali uh, advises we follow. And they all make uh, the uh, quiescence of the mind easy and natural. With these four dispositions, uh, the mind is left free. It's free of uh, rivalry, it's free of cruelty, it's free of jealousy, it's free of hatred. And then it's possible to meditate, easily. then it's possible to experience one's real nature. The word that Patanjali uses is prasada, which means tranquility, sweetness, joy. And experiencing this, then we're experiencing ourselves in the best way possible. And it means that uh, when we go about our lives and uh, undertake our responsibilities in the world and do our jobs and so on, we can take with us a little touch of that uh, sweetness. And it isn't in any way artificial. It's not even necessary to try and do it. It's just what happens. And it can express itself through words, through thoughts, through actions. So this is the first practical aspect of the school of philosophy. The meditation uh, which uh, gives us the experience I've spoken about. And the advice from the sage uh, Patanjali, again, is uh, most practical. So if we want to bend and stretch and come into all kinds of uh, difficult yogic uh, positions, then okay. Uh, and that can have its place. But... Uh, in essence, the yoga is not physical. 
It's to do with the state of being. So this is uh, number one in relation to the uh, School of Practical Philosophy. And uh, this naturally combines itself with the second element, which is uh, practical, and that is uh, knowledge. And uh, when I say knowledge, really what is meant is uh, knowledge of the true nature of ourselves. We can have knowledge of uh, things of the world, of engineering or agriculture or filmmaking or bread making or a thousand, a million different uh, possibilities. And it's with this kind of worldly knowledge that we earn our livings. Uh, in practice, it seems very necessary that we have knowledge of something uh, which is valued and which uh, people will be happy to pay for. But this is a worldly knowledge. Important and practical though it is, it's nevertheless uh, a worldly knowledge. And sometimes you get uh, people who are extremely uh, bright and clever and intellectually able and uh, they seem to know about everything under the sun and uh, they might work very hard to try and know about everything under the sun. But the truth of the matter is that at the end of the day, whatever they may know, it's a drop in the ocean of the sum total of knowledge. No one person can know everything. It's just impossible. So there are, as a guess, some 200 people here. And if we were to spend the next couple of days writing out all the knowledge that we had, uh, and it would be, I'm sure, extremely varied, the knowledge that each person has, uh, it would be fantastic. It would be a great deal of knowledge. But even that, even the sum total of all of us would also only be a drop in the ocean of the totality of knowledge. So this is the worldly knowledge, and uh, people pursue that as well they may in their lives. But uh, in the School of Philosophy, uh, the knowledge that is uh, aimed at is the knowledge of our real self. So I'll give you an example. One of the Upanishads says that the real nature of the self is complete, full, total, perfect. The word in Sanskrit is purna. Now, it's not always the case that we experience ourselves in this way. As often as not, there's an underlying assumption that I am in some way incomplete. And this is the source of all the desires that uh, the mind may have, because believing oneself to be incomplete, then there's a desire for this, a desire for that, a desire for 101 other things in order to try and make myself complete to go to this place, to do that thing, to meet this person, to undertake that activity, and so on, and so on, and so on. And it's all, if you examine it carefully, in order to fill out a sense of uh, lack of completeness. But the Upanishad tells us that, in truth, already, we are complete. There's nothing lacking. It's not really necessary to uh, do all these things. What's necessary is to uh, experience, to realize and to experience that pre-existing completeness. So, 
So you can uh, begin any situation, any day, any activity, either with the idea of being incomplete, and uh, the likelihood is that that's not going to help the activity, or the same thing can be begun with the sense of the completeness of the self. Now, it's true, you, you still have to uh, rise to the challenge of whatever it is, you still have to find out whatever is needed and so on, but there's a world of difference between the two starting points. One gives confidence and the other uh, gives a lack of confidence. So to take a practical example, one man said that um, all of his life he has uh, um, made things and fixed things and done things with his hands. And he feels that uh, whenever it's necessary to fix something or do something, he is going to succeed in doing it. There's no question about that. There's a complete trust in the hands, in the ability to find out whatever's needed and do it. Not everyone shares this uh, confidence in the hands, but anyway, uh, this is the case, and it works. Because it's a reflection of the purna, the completeness. If you start with the idea, I'm hopeless with my hands, uh, I've never fixed anything other than change the odd <laughs> light bulb or something like that, then uh, there's a very strong probability that whatever it is, is not going to happen. Now, this is just a simple practical example. But the same way, if we meet life as complete, as full, and therefore able to respond to whatever may be uh, thrown at us, whatever may be in front of us, whatever may be needed, then uh, that sense of completeness is going to meet that situation and meet it well. Meet it uh, intelligently, attentively, creatively. So this is the kind of knowledge which, in the school of philosophy, uh, we try to understand and experience. And of course, it's one thing to say that. I mean, you can, one can uh, understand the idea of completeness and. You might even master the old Sanskrit word. But um, the reality of the experience is another matter. And in practice, it needs practice. And it needs practice again and again and again. And gradually, the experience fills up. It fills out. <coughs> Take uh, the example of meditation, and I think a good number of people here have uh, received the meditation, and I hope others uh, will in due course do so. It's possible to start that with a sense of quiet confidence in oneself, confidence in the meditation. Uh, from a sense of uh, confidence, completeness in oneself. Or somebody might think, I'm hopeless at this, I'll never manage to get the mind still, I'll never manage to experience anything relating to stillness. And that tends to work. <laughs> it's self-fulfilling. So, uh, the idea is that we can meet life with uh, spiritual knowledge. Knowledge of spirit, not just knowledge of the world. The outer vision tells us there are many. 
So the two eyes tell me there are 200 people here. The inner vision, if it's awakened, uh, says that there's one person here. There's one consciousness. There are 200 bodies, certainly, 200 personalities, but there is something which unites all of these people, which is common to all of these people. And you can't see this with the eyes or touch it with the hands or hear it with the ears. It is recognized by the inner vision. And it's this inner vision that the uh, knowledge of spirit awakens. Years ago, I used to have, a, I used to be in a group in a school in London, and uh, it was a group made up of young people. And the man in charge of the group was uh, a most uh, wonderful man, and uh, he had a great uh, love of young people. And uh, he used to periodically regale us with stories of how he would have come across, as he would put it, a group of errant youths in some town center. And uh, he would berate them and uh, challenge them and um, in one way or another try to encourage them to stand up. Anyway, if anyone other than him had done this, I'm sure they would have been beaten up, not standing up. Uh, it, would have, it would have been met with a hostile response. But uh, what was obvious is that as far as he was con concerned, he didn't have the idea of other. These people were not other than himself. They were not separate, they were not better or worse, they were, there was just no sense of other. And that made it possible for him to speak in the way that he did. And they responded, on the whole, extremely well to it. Because they recognized the love behind it. So when the inner vision is opened up and it does uh, convey the reality of the unity, then it's most practical. It means that it's possible to uh, speak to anyone, it's possible to be in any situation and not feel ill at ease, not feel ill-equipped. So, for example, you might go from some uh, extremely posh, expensive gala dinner with uh, dignitaries and uh, the like to a building site. And there wouldn't be a difference. It would be possible to connect with the people at both places just as easily. Again, in one of the Upanishads, the uh, description is that such a person enjoys freedom of all the freedom in all the worlds. And the common uh, situation is that we may experience freedom in one situation. Uh, we may experience the freedom in our family, with our family, or in our work situation. Uh, or if we play football or something in that situation. But if we're asked to go somewhere else, somewhere that we're not familiar with, that we're not experienced with, then we may feel self-conscious, we may feel nervous, ill at ease, unhappy. Or we may feel uh, at ease in doing physical work, of one kind, but asked to do physical work of another kind, again we feel ill at ease. We may feel happy or not happy with a study of one kind or another, with spiritual work of one kind or another. All of these are different worlds, different physical worlds, different mental worlds, different emotional worlds. And the more we understand the completeness of the self, the more happily we can, uh, we can be in any of these worlds. 
And that is a great uh, freedom. There's a lot spoken about freedom of movement, to go physically from one place to another. But the real freedom of movement is this freedom of movement, to go from one world to another. In physical terms, it may be, from, uh, it may be 100 yards down the road. It's nothing. But the, the world in one place and the world 100 yards away might be completely different. So in the school, all sorts of uh, unusual activities are introduced, things like calligraphy and uh, Sanskrit and uh, making bread and all kinds of things. And for most people, or many people, these are new. Um, uh, I remember being introduced to calligraphy and it was all extremely strict and we had uh, boards and paper with clips and pens with ink and, and not just an ordinary fountain pen but each pen had a reservoir and so one had to put the ink in and um, the result was spectacular <laughs> because uh, there could be ink all over the place. Not just the paper, but uh, if somebody had forgotten to take the carpet up, the carpet and everywhere. Uh, and yet some people took to it like a duck to water. Some people just loved it and it sailed on. Um, but it's excellent to be put in a situation that you're completely unfamiliar with. Because uh, what you find in that sort of situation is that, all right, the beginning may not be all that great, but if you persevere and stick at it, after a while you can draw straight lines, and the vertical lines are quite easy. Horizontal is more difficult. Circles are more difficult still. But after a time, you get the hang of it. And it's a great lesson, because we talk about the self being complete without limits. And there you are in front of a calligraphy board full of limits. I can't do this. I can't possibly do this. Why on earth am I being asked to do this? And so on. But you, you overcome the limit. And the moment the limit is overcome and the completeness is experienced, it's full of joy. And it turns out that for some people, an exercise like calligraphy is the best possible thing because it's the way they may connect with the attention. It's the way that they may write beautiful words, create beautiful things. And so for some people, it's a real way of liberation. But for everyone, it's good to try it. For everyone, it's good to overcome any sense of uh, limitation. Even if you don't go on to be a master calligrapher, it's possible to experience uh, something of the completeness of the self. So this is the second aspect of the work of the school the meditation and the knowledge of spirit. And uh, this takes place in a group and that turns out to be a great blessing because uh, let's for argument's sake that say there are 10 people in the group and 10 people have their own particular insight or realization and uh, they speak about that and so the experience is multiplied by 10. You're not confined to just your experience. The third aspect of the practical work of the school is service. Again, if I can come back to the Upanishad, uh, there's a statement that the person who serves comes close. in particular, comes close to the teacher. 
to the teaching. And coming close, that person acquires wisdom. And so service turns out to be uh, essential. The practical fact of the matter is that the school couldn't last for five minutes without service. All of this that we see, this building, this hall, the fact that we're all here is uh, only due to the uh, service and devotion of a lot of people. So the school here this year is celebrating its uh, 40th anniversary and that signifies that for 40 years the front door of the school has been held open. Term in, term out, year in, year out. Uh, whatever the weather, the seasons, whatever the circumstances, uh, without fail, the door has been open. People have been able to come in and uh, study philosophy, which is remarkable, and all without anyone being paid a penny to do that. Tutors, secretaries, refreshment teams, people who clean the building, make sure it's, clean the room, make sure it's nice, and so on and so on. And uh, none of this would be possible without the service which uh, people in the school are inspired to perform. So it uh, makes it possible for the school to operate, but more than that, it uh, develops the person who participates. When a person uh, serves in a full-hearted manner uh, in the school, they get close to the school. They begin to understand what the school is really about. They begin to appreciate the teaching in a different light, in a fuller way. So this is um, part and parcel of the uh, work of the school. It uh, provides a real uh, working surface for the knowledge to be put into practice. So these are the uh, three elements that we have for the School of Practical Philosophy, the meditation, the knowledge of spirit, and the service. Now, I am totally and completely biased. Uh, I'm afraid you just have to accept that fact. But uh, in my view, there is nowhere like it anywhere. It's the best show in town. It's the most uh, practical, the most real. Uh, it's where people can and do really connect with their real nature. So this is my totally biased opinion. It's the best show in town. And the proof of that is that you're here. Because you're the best show in town. And anyone who uh, makes the effort can rise up and experience themselves more and more fully. More and more completely. So that's what it's about, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much.